Thanks very much. It's great to be here again and uh, to give you a sort of a very biased view of what Alzheimer's disease is all about. It's not the first time I've spoken in this theatre. I think it's the second time. So thanks, Julio, for your kind invitations. Um, I'm going to tell you about Alzheimer's and then I'm going to try and ask the question, what have we learnt from Alzheimer's that might be of some interest to the people who work on psychoses? So it's a... It's a uh, it's a very difficult subject, as Ian has uh, alluded to. Um, at the beginning, I have to disclose a few things. One is that I'm totally biased towards uh, EBEDA. These are the plaques up here on the, uh, I'll use the pointer here, described more than 100 years ago as the, one of the principal changes in Alzheimer's disease. And I know we have one or two EBEDA skeptics in the audience today. I'm looking at Ian and uh, a few other people around here. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I just want to be patient. I get, at the end of my talk, I do have one tau slide, one tau slide. Uh, the other disclosure is that I have a uh, financial interest in uh, a spin-out company that Prima Biotechnology that will be uh, referred to later on. All right, because of the uh, skepticism of around A-beta as the cause of Alzheimer's disease, I just summarize here the, the main elements. I probably uh, shouldn't go through them each one. Um, for those of you who um, don't know the story is that A-beta is the major macromolecule present in the amyloid plaque. Uh, mutations in the genes surrounding the biogenesis of A-beta cause early onset uh, autosomal dominantly inherited uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we are now beginning to see correlations of um, the amyloid load using new technologies that I'll refer to in a minute. Um, the, um, uh, the close association of uh, triplication of the APP gene uh, uh, occurs in Down syndromes, which all cases of which get um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I just draw your attention to this particular interaction that I'm going to concentrate on, and that is that A-beta, the amyloid subunit, uh, interacts with copper and zinc and provides an explanation uh, for the uh, long puzzling selective topographic dispersion of the lesions in the brain. So in the Alzheimer brain, there is a heavy concentration of these plaques in the glutamatergic system, uh, which is related, we believe, in part to the uh, high concentrations of extra synaptic uh, zinc and copper in, in that system. Um, the single major genetic risk factor for uh, late onset Alzheimer's disease is ap the ApoE polymorphism, which is in some ways related to the, uh, possibly related to the A-beta uh, pathway. And there is now increasing evidence, very um, uh, preliminary though some, somewhat, that there is a failure of the clearance mechanisms of A-beta in the aging brain, which uh, gives rise to the gradual accumulation of A beta in the brain in the form of these insoluble plaques. Okay, so this is still a contentious area that if, if the theory of A beta causing Alzheimer's is right, why haven't all the therapeutic uh, interventions that have been thrown at A beta so far, why haven't they worked? And then finally, of course, is that there are no other viable alternate theories. So when you look at the biogenesis of A beta in the brain, uh, you come down to a selection process of looking at the ways to inhibit its uh, function uh, or, or its biogenesis through inhibiting the, um, the enzymes that create this molecule, that's the gamma secretase or beta secretases, or you begin to discuss the uh, aspects of how do you promote the clearance of this molecule from the brain uh, both of those uh, therapeutic strategies are fraught with difficulty because once you try to interfere in those pathways, you run the risk of uh, uh, major side effects interfering with normal catabolic processes. Uh, we've taken the view that it's safer to go for the toxic gain of function of this molecule in the brain, and that is target the species of A beta in the brain which are actually causing damage. and. Uh, most of the field today agrees that it is a oligomeric form of A-beta in the brain, which is the principal target. Now, the, um, 
Again, this is a long text slide. I, I can assure you after this, all these slides are very uh, simple and uh, pic pictorial, but I just want to take you again through the words here so that we're, we're all on the same page. Um, a beta itself, 42 amino acid peptide, dimerizes, and this dimerization process is key to understanding its toxicity in the brain. The dimerization of A beta is driven at the N terminus by a metal binding site and at the C terminus by a particular hydrophobic uh, motif, which is called the GXXG motif, which is typical of a transmembrane protein. Uh, the metal binding site uh, may be either zinc or copper uh, modulated. If zinc comes into, co into contact with uh, A beta, it tends to drive it down an amyloidogenic pathway. If copper comes into contact, it drives it more into a uh, soluble oligomeric pathway. And uh, what we found is that the stoichiometry, the relationship of the amount of copper to the amount of peptide is critical because if you have a sub-equimolar ratio of copper to peptide, you get amyloid fibrils form, that is the plaques, but at supra-equimolar ratios, you get the soluble oligomers of a beta formed often with a cross-linking uh, through the dityrosine. And we've recently been able to show that this toxicity correlates with these dimers and trimers, these oligomers binding to the cell surface, probably through phosphatidylserine head groups in a stereospecific uh, manner. All right, so that's the sort of theoretical underpinnings of what I'm about to show you pictorially. If you take the brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease and you uh, just divide it simply into the soluble fraction and the insoluble fraction and you do a Western blot for the A-beta protein, what you find is that in the soluble fraction you find 1% of the total A-beta. However, the 99% of A-beta is locked away in these plaques and it's shown here. And so you can see the monomer, the dimer, the trimer in Alzheimer's disease. But it is the 1% soluble fraction that correlates with the amount of synaptic damage we see in the brain at the time of death. Remember, this is a process that goes on over 10, 20 years, so what we look at in post-mortem material is very much end-stage brain. Now, over the last um, 10 years or so, I've, I've worked on this molecule, 42 amino acids, for the better part of my life, for the last 35 years, and today we still don't have a good atomic resolution structure of this peptide, and that is because this peptide doesn't assume just one structure, it is a very multi, uh, multi-form protein, with, depending on the microenvironment in which it is found, uh, its shape, its structure is determined by the microenvironment. When it's in a lipid uh, environment, that is when it's in the, tra in the transmembrane uh, domain of a, of a cell, in the plasma membrane of a neuron near a synapse, the C terminus assumes a alpha helical conformation, and the bit that's poking just out of the uh, membrane on the extra cytosolic side is unstructured, uh, but partly coordinated by this metal binding site. So my colleagues, uh, Luke Miles and Michael Parker from the St. Vincent's Institute of Medical Research, two years ago solved the first eight residues of A beta using uh, an antibody to confine it and constrict it. And this is shown schematically here from residues five through uh, to uh, serine eight. But the metal binding site, which we're all so interested in, is down around 13, 14. So we still haven't actually got an atomic resolution of the metal binding site. Now my colleagues are working at CSIRO, Victor Strelstoff and Stuart Nuttall, Joe Spargazi published a few weeks ago, uh, another form of a crystal structure of the A beta molecule, this time from residues 16 through to 42. This is the so-called P3 fragment. And uh, surprisingly, we came up again with a very, uh, it had to be part of a fusion protein. It had to be constrained by being in the center of a protein, but it did form soluble tetramers. And this is what the structure looks like. I won't go through it in detail. This is a dimer-dimer interface here, which is beginning now to give us uh, at least a structure upon which we can do uh, medicinal uh, chemistry and, and, and drug discovery. 
However, the critical bit that we're still after is between 8 and 16, and nobody has yet been able to crystallise that bit of the fragment. We have NMR structures, we have models, and so on and so forth. We actually haven't seen it in a, in a crystal structure. Uh, from, from the structural analyses that we have to date, uh, this is a model of what we think it looks like. So here is a typical uh, lipid bilayer with the uh, polar head group sitting up here and the hydrophobic interior here. We think this is a tetrameric structure and the, um, I, I think you can just see a little black dot here, this is the metal binding site. Uh, this is the hydrophobic uh, domains which project partly into the membrane and this is the hydrophilic domains which sit just on the surface. So this is our model, it's our conception of what the toxic principle is going on in the brain. So these tetramers or some structure like this is the one that's sitting on the surface of the plasma membrane near a synapse, not actually in the synapse, but in the juxtasynaptic space, which is in some way interfering with the normal function of synapses, particularly in the glutamatergic system of the brain and thereby uh, giving rise to everything that we know about Alzheimer's in terms of its cognitive uh, impairment. Now, about 10 years ago, my colleagues and I realised that we knew enough of the molecular biology of Alzheimer's disease to get on and do something else. In other words, to get off our backsides and actually do something about developing drugs. This is what we would normally call translational medicine. And to do this, I believe 10 years ago, and I believe even more strongly now, that to understand Alzheimer's disease, we really have to come to grips with the natural history of Alzheimer's disease. And the only way to do that was to do longitudinal studies in a carefully defined population. So about five years ago, uh, a number of us got together with su strong support from the uh, um, CSIRO to form a group called the Australian Imaging Biomarker Lifestyle Flagship Study of Aging and the different partners are listed there. So this goes under the acronym of ABLE. And I want to use this as, a, um, as a, uh, an example of how we might translate this type of approach into understanding the normal uh, natural history of some of the psychotic illnesses as well. So it's very simple, straightforward. We took 1,000 individuals, we took about 700, 68 uh, healthy controls, this was mean age around 72, 73, 133 individuals with mild cognitive impairment and approximately 200 individuals with uh, full-blown Alzheimer's disease meeting all the standard criteria. And we subjected them to baseline 18 months and we're now at the 36 month uh, follow-up um, and uh, attack them with the typical four streams, cl clinical cognitive stream, all the, all the usual cognitive instruments applied to measuring cognitive decline. We collected information on lifestyle. We had a heavy emphasis on biomarker, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And of course, uh, we capitalized on the new technology, which is revolutionizing this field at the moment, which is around uh, actual molecular neuroimaging of the amyloid accumulating in the brain in real time. So uh, about, again, five, ten years ago, uh, the people in Pittsburgh, uh, Bill Clunk and Chet Mathis, uh, took a compound that had been known for the last 40 years. This is a, an analogue of thioflavin T and called it Pittsburgh Compound B and tweaked it a little bit. Uh, this was a compound that was known to bind amyloid in histological sections. And what they did was very smart. They just tweaked it a bit so it actually got over the blood-brain barrier. And so once you uh, can figure out how to get a molecule through the blood-brain barrier, you can uh, label it with uh, radio uh, ligands, for example, and then you can follow its retention in the brain. And when you do that, you compare a healthy control in a PET scan uh, compared to Alzheimer's disease. It's like black and white, night and day. It's sort of, you know, uh, you can see the amyloid, so-called amyloid. You can see the retention signal sitting there. So the, this has given us a real breakthrough in understanding the natural history of Alzheimer's disease. If we look at this ABLE cohort and break them down into these three groups, uh, the Alzheimer's disease group have a quantitative uh, measure 
of the retention signal, which is called the, uh, the standard uptake a volume ratio of SUVR of a mean value here, you can see of around 2.3, uh, 2.4. A uh, couple of individuals who are negative. We've established a cutoff value here of currently in our series of 1.5. The, the, the people with so called mild cognitive impairment clearly fall into two major groups those who are on the way towards getting Alzheimer's disease and those who've got something else going on in their brain. So clearly a bimodal distribution. But the most important group, of course, is the healthy controls, <coughs> of whom 30% are in the uh, uh, positive range, above the cutoff levels. And so we now believe that this is the 30% of 70, uh, mean age 72, 73 years of age who will, over a period of time, go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. And more importantly, that those individuals who are sitting in this negative group uh, more than likely will never get Alzheimer's disease. This is hypothetical at this point. We suspect that if we were to scan 80 to 90 year olds and show that their brains are not positive by this uh, measure, they will never get Alzheimer's. It doesn't matter how many years they live. Now that's a contentious statement, but I believe it will turn out to be correct. All right, so as I say, this ABLE study has now been going for um, well, it's over four years now, but we're just in the middle of collecting the three-year data, but the 18-month data are now coming through. This PET technique has been around for a little bit longer, so I can show you some of the longitudinal studies. And here you can see individual subjects, and they, uh, as they're being rescanned at approximately 18 to 20 months, and later individuals. And so we're now beginning to see the rates of accumulation per year of amyloid in the brain. So let's look first of all at the Alzheimer uh, population. It's increasing at a rate of about 3.5% per year. Uh, the MCI group, 1.4% per year, and those who are uh, negative are not really uh, changing much down here. Uh, the healthy control group are also increasing at a very slow, slow rate. So that's beginning to put some parameters around the rates of accumulation of amyloid in the brain. Uh, the uh, conversion rates, that is people can moving from one category to the next, are very interesting that uh, in the MCI group we can now see that over this interval about 70% of people who start off here uh, will convert into, you know, uh, meet the criteria for Alzheimer's disease within, within this interval, whereas 14% uh, of uh, healthy controls move into the uh, MCI group. All right, so we now have what, what to us is emerging as a gold standard that can be used against which we can do biomarker discovery. Uh, these biomarkers, of course, can be either candidate biomarkers directed to the actual pathway that we know causes Alzheimer's disease, or you can do, as uh, Ian has been doing for many years, search for everything or anything that moves and go wherever it takes you. Uh, it's a very difficult process. So when we, uh, we, we of course, uh, would like to have a blood test for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we would like to explore the possibility that peripheral markers of A beta metabolism in blood will give us a clue as to what's going on. Uh, we can see, for example, that the uh, absolute uh, values of A beta in plasma are decreasing as the natural history of Alzheimer's takes its course. Um, my colleague uh, Kevin Barnum has made, a, I believe, is a major discovery, and that is everyone's looking in the wrong place for A beta in the blood. If you just look in the plasma, you don't see that much. But if you take the cellular elements, that's the white cells, red cell membranes, and uh, platelets, and actually extract the lipid in the blood, and there you see the oligomers. And this is what uh, has been difficult to see in the past. But uh, here, for example, is a mass spectrometry, mass spectroscopic method of looking at monomers, dimers, and trimers, which are pulled down with an antibody. And when you begin to do this, you begin to see correlations with uh, in vitro measures of toxicity, 
But more importantly, when you use these population cohorts and begin to measure, for example, the A-beta dimers in the blood, uh, you're beginning to see correlations between uh, cognitive changes, uh, uh, MRI volumetrics, and uh, mo most importantly, correlations with the uh, PIB uh, neocortical uh, signals. Now, uh, the other obvious candidate biomarker for Alzheimer's disease is APOE, being a uh, prime genetic risk factor determining the age at onset. It doesn't tell you whether you're going to get Alzheimer's or not. The haplotype of APOE just simply determines whether you're going to get it at 74 or 85 or 95. Interestingly, when we've taken the bloods in this ABLE uh, cohort and actually measured the absolute levels of APOE, we can show a decline in the levels uh, of APOE. This is like um, nobody's done this before. Why, I don't know, but they hadn't at all concentrated on the gene. So again, this is telling us something important about the, um, uh, the way of um, the interaction between A-beta and uh, APOE. We're still trying to figure out what it, what it all means. Now, the other way of doing biomarker discovery is to take um, uh, the proteomic approach where you can uh, take a um, proprietary uh, screening panel of 152 analytes, for example, and just screen everything that moves in blood. When you do that, you end up with a massive data set that needs to be uh, machine uh, da data mined, uh, and then you come up with all sorts of fancy statistics as to what it means when this particular analyte goes up and that other particular analyte goes down. Uh, we're still in the process of trying to uh, uh, get all that data together, but we are seeing uh, signals that go with the evolution of the disease. So just to summarize <coughs> where we're at at the moment in terms of predictive power of some of these different uh, peripheral markers, either the uh, PET scan, the APOE genotype, uh, or APO APOE level, uh, cognitive measures, MRI volumetrics, um, the measurement of the uh, oligomer uh, in the blood or the uh, plasma A-beta uh, levels. If we're just trying to predict those individuals who are moving from healthy controls into uh, mild cognitive impairment, you can see that all of these measures are not giving us a very accurate measure. So we are far, far away yet. They are, however, a little uh, more encouraging in the negative predictive value where, for example, if you're PIB negative in your 70s, uh, you have a 97% chance of not going into any form of dementia over the ensuing eight, 18 months, which is nice to know. However, once you hit MCI and you measure the rates of conversion from mild cognitive impairment uh, to Alzheimer's disease, suddenly then the accuracy of all of these measures moves up quite a bit. You can see that by combinatorial analysis, you're beginning to get these peripheral uh, biomarkers to, to become into the range of utility. Uh, and also the negative predictive values uh, are important. So to summarize a lot of data at this point, this is the way that we currently look at Alzheimer's disease. We have on this axis 14 to 15 years of um, uh, the natural history. Uh, we're saying that if you're no amyloid in the brain, you are free of Alzheimer's, and over the following 15 years, you're not going to, you'll get other things, you're not going to get Alzheimer's disease. However, once you are in the positive range, you're then on a curve that looks something like this. You can be a healthy control and quite stable. You can be somebody who's normal and converting slowly over to MCI or directly into Alzheimer's. You can be stable as an MCI. You can be stable as an Alzheimer, and then you can suddenly get into a situation where you are having Alzheimer's and you're rapidly progressing. And it all seems to be related to the amount of amyloid that you have in the brain. There are genes controlling this pathway. We still, we think that uh, some new data coming out from WashU suggests that the rate of progression of Alzheimer's disease is related to the genetic uh, components of the phosphorylation of tau in the calcineurin pathway. And because of that, we are actually interested in tau. And we had a paper out in Brain last week 
where we have the first tau ligand uh, in a mouse, not a human yet. We're gearing up to do this. So this is a compound developed, uh, interestingly, by our Japanese colleagues in Sendai. They escaped the earthquake. Many of their computers crashed and were damaged. However, um, they, uh, they survived. Um, so here is a wild-type animal. Here's an Alzheimer animal. And here is a tau overexpressing animal. And if you look at the brains, uh, this is a micro pet, you'll see a red color up here, which is quantitated over here. So this is the first tau ligand, which is um, about to undergo phase one study in humans, and I think will be of interest to the general community. Of course, we would like a ligand for A beta oligomers. And after Mal's talk, uh, you'll probably see why we would uh, like a ligand for uh, alpha synuclein as well. Now, um, I just want to move very briefly into our therapeutic strategies based around our structural and conceptual analysis of what A-beta is about. So <clears throat> we've been uh, designing compounds to attack the oligomer of A-beta. So these are small molecular weight hydrophobic compounds that can cross the blood-brain barrier, and they have relatively high, but not very high, uh, affinity for metal ions, such as zinc and copper. In other words, the affinity of these compounds for a metal ion is of the order of uh, 10 to the minus 11, which is in the pico molar range. The metal binding site on A-beta, in contrast, is two orders of magnitude less in the nanomolar range. And the idea is that this compound will compete for the metals uh, at this metal binding site of A-beta. When it does this, it uh, prevents the uh, N termini of A-beta coming together and uh, keeps the, the dimer separate. So it then allows the monomer to be degraded through the normal clearance mechanisms in the brain. So that's the, one of the um, underpinnings of this particular theory. So this class of compounds, uh, which are 8-hydroxyquinolines, has undergone a medicinal uh, chemistry program uh, with Prana Biotechnology, and a compound called PBT2 has evolved from this, which recently went, when I say recently, two years ago, uh, went through um, uh, early phase 2A studies in which we were able to demonstrate that after a 12-week administration of this compound in people with early Alzheimer's disease, there was a significant beneficial effect on different uh, cognitive tests of executive function, and for those of you who are interested, uh, also had a very uh, significant effect on a principal biomarker, which turns out to be CSFA beta in uh, A beta 42. And you can see here a placebo uh, my, uh, intermediate dose and high dose of this compound. Now, the, uh, we're about to take this compound forward into imaging studies, uh, but uh, that's where we're at at the moment. There are many other drugs currently under development in the big pharma. Uh, that drug I've mentioned is PBT2, but there are a number of other inhibitors of gamma secretase and, in, and uh, antibodies directed at getting this molecule out of the brain or inhibiting its toxicity in the brain. Um, I don't think I've got time really to go through them now, but if anyone's interested in where the current uh, phase two studies are in this, um, in this mad race to get something that, it, that affects a beta in the brain, um, I'd be happy to go into it in, in discussion. Now, I just wanted to say a few words about um, our efforts in Parkinson's disease because I know Mal's going to talk to you about uh, the subject in a moment. Um, our current uh, view of Parkinson's disease, again, very biased and very narrow and very perhaps too simplistic. Uh, we think that in the dopaminergic system, uh, a number of uh, oxidative uh, radicals are um, generated through which uh, peroxynitrates cause a uh, oxidative damage of a molecule called alpha-synuclein, which then undergoes an oligomerization process, which ends up, depending on a particular pathway, it will end up as a Lewy body or damaging the synapse. And we now have different ligands of what we can monitor the efficacy of uh, drugs for um, targeting this pathway. This is the VMAT2 uh, uh, um, uh, vesicular monoamine transport 
uh, signal in a human brain and we think that it is a reflection of the dopaminergic vesicles which on their outer surface have these alpha-synuclein oligomers. So we've started a drug discovery program around uh, this idea that drugs that um, have the ability to interfere uh, with um, this particular oxidative modification of alpha-synuclein. Uh, one drug is shown here, for example, and uh, in one particular model of Alzheimer's disease, you can see that uh, if you look at a, a, a mouse brain that's been poisoned with uh, MPTP and the drug, um, and you, you then image the brain for the release of uh, iron, Fe, uh, you can see that this drug is very effective at shutting down uh, this um, iron response. Similarly, it also affects the uh, uh, total amount of alpha-synuclein uh, expressed in the brain. Another form of compound which is being developed by Kevin Barnum, shown here, and this, this was also very effective at shutting down uh, the proxy nitrate uh, oxidative modification of uh, alpha-synuclein in different types of uh, models. So these drugs are all preclinical at this stage. Right, how are we going on time? Good, so I want to end, not with this credit slide, but with a couple off the cuff comments about how to get onto the psychotic illnesses. I believe that um, uh, the only way to really do a um, proper biomarker discovery around the psychosis, be it bipolar, schizophrenia or whatever, is to take the extremes of the phenotypes. That is, you take the extremes of treatment-resistant uh, psychosis, that is the, uh, let's say, clozapine-resistant uh, schizophrenics, or you take people with uh, depression who only are about to undergo ECT because every other uh, therapy has failed. And you have to take these extreme phenotypes and compare them to another control group where they have n absolutely no chance of ever developing that phenotype. So you would need to take the control group from a very elderly population, for example, who's been through life and you know they're not going to develop these things. Uh, now, I'm not in any way disparaging uh, uh, trying to discover um, phenotypes in early age. I think uh, that um, by all means, I think that if we can identify young individuals uh, you know, in the critical period of life where the brain is maturing and converting from the prepubescent in the, into the pubescent state where the highest risk for these uh, psychoses uh, are, that this is also a very valid approach. But I think the field is so difficult there that it's just very hard to uh, get a pure phenotype within those groups. So the first episode psychoses groups are clearly of interest um, and, and do need to be collected and analyzed, but I, I think I would be putting my money at the other end of the spectrum. So uh, as a very uninformed individual uh, working <laughs> as a director of a mental health research institute, that's my gratuitous advice for those of you who um, would seek to find the cause of schizophrenia and depression. So um, here is um, to do this sort of population-based studies is incredibly um, expensive and uh, time-consuming, obviously, and it takes a vast array of people to do this, and many different institutions have contributed to these population-based studies. Our own groups working at the University of Melbourne, Mental Health Research Institute, in association with Spinouts and Big Pharma and Small Pharma, and so on, are acknowledged here. Um, I've mentioned many of the names of the people whose uh, work uh, Paul Adler has been working on, some of the uh, zinc transporters in the brain. Kevin's been very um, uh, contributing towards the, um, the medicinal chemistry around some of the compounds. Ashley Bush just got a straight fellowship around this, and so on and so forth. I can't go through them all in uh, detail. Chris Rowe, Victor Villamania have been, uh, um, been running the Pet Center at Austin and uh, have produced outstanding results. Thank you very much. <laughs>